family here. If they get out of line, just let me know, all right? I'll be sure to straighten them back up, but my family is here this morning. It's good to have you. My siblings, I have two siblings. My brother Trent, can you just wave at everybody? This is Trent. Everybody say hi, Trent. And my sister Kendra is right there. She's my younger sister. Everybody say hi, Kendra. Since my, my siblings are here, can I embarrass them in front of you? Is that all right? Very good. Hey, let's do this thing. All right. Now I want to tell you today that uh, me and my siblings, we got along pretty darn well growing up. In fact, I would venture, I would, I would even say we were angelic. No issues, we never fought, we never yelled, we never argued, and we certainly never ever got in trouble. Is that right, guys? <laughs> Amen, absolutely, yeah, they agree with me. No, that's actually, it's actually, if anything, the complete opposite. <clears throat> uh, me and my, my brother Trent, we got along really, really well, let me tell you. Um, we were best friends growing up. I cannot, I cannot recall a time where me and Trent had a, like, gloves-off argument. We usually got along pretty well. Uh, but me and my sister, on the other hand, is a different story. Uh, there was a lot of finger-pointing between me and my sister. We didn't get along uh, as well as me and Trent do. Luckily, now that we're older and we're adults, we do get along and we have a great time together. But as kids, it seems like we were always at each other's throats. I got really good at this thing that only older brothers can do. Uh, I got really, really good at it, where in secret, in private, when mom and dad weren't looking, I would get Kendra all riled up, right? It's like shaking a bottle of soda before it's about to blow, right? You get her all riled up. And then when she blows up, and mom and dad come on the scene, you act like, I have no idea what's happening, right? This came out of nowhere. I'm completely innocent, right? Um, that's what I did. I got really, really good at it. You know how they say if you do something for 10,000 hours, you become an expert? Have you ever heard that? I'm an expert in getting my sister riled up. I got really, really, really good at it. I'd get her riled up, and then she'd point the finger at me. And I'd act innocent. I don't know what happened. There was a lot of finger pointing between me and my sister. Can I give you another story? This is, like I said, me and Trent got along really, really well. But there was one story in particular that's become like legend in my family that we tell over and over again between me and my brother. And I guess when we were younger, there was some kind of disagreement. And Trent got really aggravated at me. And so he came up with the perfect crime. The perfect crime. What he did was he rolled up his sleeve, and he bit himself as hard as he could, as hard as he possibly can, bit himself. Then he started crying. Then he ran out to my parents. He showed them the bite mark, and you know what he said? Jaron bit me. That's what he said. Look, Jaron bit me. He blamed it on me. The finger was pointed at me. And obviously, again, I was always the innocent one. I never did anything wrong. I don't know what happened. Uh, we ran through, we ran the bite marks through forensics, we did some dental testing, and we found out that it was not me who bit my brother. And here's how we knew. When I was uh, a little kid, the gap in my teeth was pretty far apart. It's gotten closer uh, since I've gotten older. My teeth have kind of grown closer. But I had a pretty big gap in between my two front teeth when I was older. And when we did the forensic testing of the bite mark, it was clear the two front teeth were not apart. And we realized that it was Trent's bite marks who matched and Trent got in trouble. And as usual, I came off clean, all right? I was innocent. A lot of finger pointing between us siblings. Anybody relate to that? Siblings or your kids or your grandkids? Lots of finger pointing in the household. This morning we're going to talk about a passage of scripture in which there is someone who is pointing the finger at someone else. The spotlight is on them. They're being questioned. They're being interrogated. And this person in particular cannot help but point the finger to someone else. That's what we're going to be talking about in just a little bit as we continue our series entitled Meek and Mild. You can see it there on the screen. This is our Advent series that we began last week. If you have your Bibles with you, you can turn with me to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, we're going to be, get, be in chapter 1 of the Gospel of John. John, he begins his gospel a little bit differently than the other three gospels. He begins it not telling the story of Jesus, the nativity story. Instead, he begins by telling us all about who Jesus is. 
And he starts it in a very particular way, and maybe a way that you're familiar with. He says, in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And John is using very theological, very philosophical language to describe who Jesus is. John continues on, and he says, everything that you see around you, all of creation that you see, was made through Jesus. Through him all things were made. He continues on and talks about how in Jesus, in the word is light, and in the word is life. And then the guy, John, who wrote the gospel, points to another man named John, a different John. John the baptizer. And he says, John the Baptist, he was a witness to this light, the light of Jesus. He came to testify to the light. And John begins his gospel telling us about John the baptizer. That's where he starts his narrative and who John the baptizer claims to be. So let's read. Whenever John the Baptist is giving the chance to say who he is and what he's about, what does John say? So let's read, beginning in verse 19, chapter 1 of the Gospel of John. Verse 19. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why do you baptize if you're not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied. But among you stands one you do not know. He's the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. And this all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. Hmm. So here's this man named John who Scripture calls John the Baptist or John the Baptizer, and he's caught the eye of Jewish leadership. John has developed quite a following. In the Gospel of Matthew, it tells us that people were coming to see John from Jerusalem and Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, all of these people trying to get into John's presence and hear what he had to say. And when you've amassed that sort of a following, it's really, really hard to ignore. The Jewish leadership, they were very, very sensitive to movements that were happening inside of the Jewish people. They always had an ear and an eye out for any sort of uprising, any sort of sects that were being created. They wanted to make sure they were on top of things because they really, really, really didn't want to make the Romans mad. So they were always looking for any kind of movements happening in the, Jew- in the Jewish people. This is why they had their eye on John the Baptist— And that's why they were very careful to keep an eye on Jesus a little bit later in the story. And the Jewish leadership, they had heard something in particular about John. They heard that he was teaching, urging people to come to repentance. But then they also heard that John was baptizing people. Now, baptizing in the the time of John, it was a familiar thing to them. It was a familiar practice. They knew what baptism was. It was something that happened. Uh, But baptism for the Jewish people in the time of John the Baptist meant something a little different than it does for us today in light of Jesus and the sacrament that he's given us. For Jews, it meant, it represented admission of converts from other religions. So if you were a Gentile, a dirty pagan Gentile, and you wanted to become a Jew, you had to do a few things. First, all of the males in your household had to be circumcised. That, made, that makes sense, right? But then, but yeah, it's pretty crazy. But then, you, you, all of the people in your household, the men, the women, and the children, all of you Gentiles had to be baptized, 
And the reason they baptized you is because you're a Gentile. You're dirty. You're icky. You're unclean. And so if you want to become a Jew, you have to go through a purification process. And that process included baptism. It's how you became a Jew from being a stinky, dirty, old Gentile. So do you kind of understand why the Jewish leadership thought this was a really, really big deal? Why they really wanted to make sure they were keeping a close eye on John? Because John was taking this purification ritual that was meant for dirty Gentiles to become clean Jews, and John was applying that purification ritual to people who were already Jews. He wasn't urging Gentiles to come and be made clean. He was telling his Jewish brothers and sisters, come, repent, be baptized, and be made clean. He was urging Jews to do the same thing Gentiles were supposed to do. He was putting Jews in the same class as pagans. It was the Jews that needed the cleansing now. And the Jewish leadership, they they couldn't let this happen. They had to figure out who this guy is. Who is this John the Baptist, and who does he think he is? Under what authority is he doing these things? And so they send a delegation. Go and ask John the Baptist who he claims to be. And so they run over, and they ask John. They have one question they need to return with the answer to. What's the question? Very simple. Who are you? That's the answer we need. Who are you? you. And it's clear early on that John's not going to play ball with them. He's not going to answer their question. And so they began to just guess. It's like a guessing game. They begin to throw out guesses. They begin with the first one, probably the biggest guess. They say, John, do you, are you claiming to be the Messiah? The Messiah. You know what Messiah means? It means the anointed one. There's a lot of people that were anointed in the Old Testament. We anointed kings and we anointed priests. Plenty of people were anointed as a symbol of their chosenness. But there's only one person that Scripture refers to, not as an anointed one, but the anointed one. And that's the Messiah. That's this mighty deliverer who has been anointed to rescue us. One anointed for a very special purpose. And so they ask John, are you claiming to be the anointed one? Is that who you are? And what does John say? I am not the Messiah. Strike one. Incorrect guess. So they try again. Anybody else got any other guesses? I have one. Are you claiming to be Elijah? You see, back in the book of Malachi, It was prophesied that when the Messiah was coming, one of the signs that the Messiah was on the way is that Elijah would come, that Elijah would be there. He would precede the Messiah. And so this is what the interrogators of John had in mind. Are you claiming to be Elijah, who like comes before the Messiah? And what does John say? I am not. Hmm. John seems to be pretty clear, but if you've read the other Gospels, you might be thinking that John's response here is very confusing. Because if you read through the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus himself explicitly says, John was the Elijah who was to come. Jesus seems to think that, yes, John the Baptist is the Elijah that Malachi was talking about. Jesus seems pretty clear. So why does John say he's not? There's two options that we can maybe go with. The first is maybe John says, I am not Elijah, because he knows that he's not the Elijah that the Jews were expecting. Does anybody remember what happened to Elijah in the Old Testament? How did Elijah's story end? Did he die? Did they bury him? Did they put him in a tomb? What happened to Elijah? A chariot of fire comes down and swoops him up, right, and takes him into heaven. And so it's because of that that the Jews thought that before the Messiah came, Elijah himself, since he didn't really die, he would reappear like the Elijah would step back on the scene before the Messiah 
came. They thought that same man would, appear, would reappear. And so maybe that's why John says, no, 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 you got it all wrong. Another possibility is maybe John the Baptist didn't know that he was the Elijah spoken of in Malachi. Maybe he just didn't know that he was a part of a prophecy. Maybe he was just being faithful, just doing what God was calling him to do, just saying the words that God was giving him, and he didn't know or care that he was a part of a greater prophecy. He was just doing the work he was called to do. And he, maybe that's why he said, I'm not Elijah. But regardless of the why, behind why he says no, he says, no, I'm not Elijah. And so the delegation throws out one final guess. They say, are you the prophet? You see, the Jews also believed that when the Messiah was on the way, all sorts of different, different prophets would appear and pop up and begin prophesying before the Messiah. And that's spoken of back in the book of Deuteronomy. But again, John says, nope, you got it wrong. That's strike three. Three guesses, and all three of them are wrong. And as you read this passage, you can kind of sense that the delegation is getting very frustrated, like they're getting angry. And so finally, they just give up the guessing game, and they just say, okay, then, who are you? Just tell us who you are. What do you say? And it's really interesting, through the rest of this passage, John says, I am, twice, and both times he doesn't really give them the answer they're looking for. Who are you? The first I am that John says, he says, I am a voice. I am a voice. That's verse 23. I'm a voice of one calling in the wilderness. I'm a voice. I'm not an anointed one. I'm not a great prophet. I'm not Elijah. I'm not one of these great prophesied characters you read about in the Old Testament. That's not me. In fact, I don't even want to be called a person. John just says, I'm just a voice calling out in the wilderness. I'm not even a voice of prominence. I'm not even a voice of influence. I'm not a voice in the temple or in the city or in Jerusalem. I'm just a voice calling out in the wilderness. You see, whenever John is given the chance to testify, he gets up on the witness stand, he gives his testimony of who he is. When he finally gets that chance, it seems like John is playing himself down as much as possible. I'm just a voice crying out in the wilderness. That's all I am. And then they continue to question him. They're like, but okay, but you're baptizing people. So how are you claiming to be able to baptize people? Why do you feel like you're able to do that? And we get John's second I am statement. He says, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. And then he says this, he is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals, here's the other I am, I am not worthy to untie. Hmm. I am not worthy to untie. So here John finally gets a second chance to testify about himself, who he is. He says, I baptize with water, I urge people to repentance but all that I do and all that I am is pointing to someone that's greater than me. This isn't about me. I, I'm pointing to someone so mighty, someone so great, someone so amazing that me, measly old John, I am not even worthy to untie the straps of his sandals. And for John to say something like that says a lot. That's a, that's a huge statement. Let me give you some perspective on why that's such a big deal. In Jesus' day, there were many different teachers who would teach Scripture to their disciples. They would garner disciples who would follow them, and they would teach Scripture to those disciples. But these teachers didn't have a salary. They weren't paid by a university. They weren't paid by a school. In fact, it was believed that to be paid to teach the Scripture was like unthinkable. How dare you, right? Right? And so in return, because they weren't paid, the disciples they were teaching were expected to serve their teachers. Like they were supposed to go and make dinner and do chores and do the laundry, all of these things for their teachers in return for the lesson because the teachers weren't paid. But if these disciples were to 
serve their teachers, I mean, they had to draw the line somewhere. Like, if you're going to let your disciples do your chores, we have to draw a line where we say, this is a little bit too far to ask of a disciple. Do you have any guess of where Jews drew the line? Where this is too far to ask of a disciple? There's actually a rabbinic saying that was very popular. You want to hear the saying? It says this, Every service that a slave performs for his master, so a disciple should do for his teacher, except the untying of one's sandals. That's an actual saying. That is a rabbinic saying. That was the drawing of the line. A, 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 a disciple can do everything for a teacher that a slave does for a master, serve him in every possible way, except asking him to untie your shoes is a little too far. I mean, that is something that is reserved for the lowest of the lowest of the low slave. To ask a disciple to do that would be extremely disrespectful. And yet here's John the Baptist. And John is here and he's saying, there's someone coming who I'm so low, I'm so unworthy, and they're so high and so powerful and so mighty and so awesome that I'm unworthy to even untie their sandals. I'm unworthy to do what the lowest of the lowest of the low slave should do. And so do you see what John is doing here in this interrogation? He finally gets a chance to get up on the witness stand and testify about himself, explain what he's doing, why he's doing it, who he is, why, what, it, what all this baptism mean, and, and, who, and what he's all about, And he answers the question, he testifies, but he does it in a very particular way. Because in this passage, even when John tries to testify about himself, he cannot help himself but to actually testify about the one who is coming. Do you see that? Every time he's asked questions about himself, he cannot help but to point fingers at the one who's coming. This delegation came to figure out who John was, and instead what they got was something very, very different. They heard about someone else. I think that's kind of why John seems to get more and more short with the questions, and he kind of gets a little bit rude after a while. He says, I'm not the Messiah, and then he says, I am not, and then he just ends it with like, no, Like, no, that's not me. He gets like short and he gets kind of rude. It's almost like John is getting so frustrated. I don't want to talk about me. Guys, quit asking me questions. Who cares about me? Let me tell you, I am a voice crying out in the wilderness. I am unworthy to untie the sandals of someone who is coming. I don't want to talk about me. John wants to testify about Jesus so, so bad that even when he gets a chance to talk about himself, he can't help but point to Jesus. This is like Advent level, baby in a manger, stinky stable kind of humility exhibited in the person of John the Baptist. This is like meek and mild to a max. He is so far out of the spotlight. He reacts in a totally unexpected way. Don't even look about me. Don't even look at me. Don't even care about me. Just let me tell you about the one that's coming. So that's John's testimony when he finally gets a chance to witness. And as I read about how John answers all of these questions and how he testifies, I I can't help but begin to wonder about each of us. The Jews get curious about all of the wacky things that John was doing, all of the unprecedented and unexpected things that he's doing, and he gets a chance to testify. And I wonder about us. How different is the life that we are living? Do people notice? How crazy are the things that we say? Do they tend to stand out? Do we tend to do things that are unexpected? Do we act in a way that is totally, 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 radically different from the way of the world? And when John finally does get a chance to testify, he doesn't fluff himself up. But instead, he wants to get away from talking about himself. 
and points to the might and the power of the coming king. What about you? When you get a chance to testify about yourself, who's really seen? When you speak to others, who is it that they hear about? How often are you presented in the center of the spotlight, wanting to be seen? There's a biblical language for everything that we're talking about this, and I could ask it this way. Who is glorified in your life? Because it seems like John is glorifying someone else. Who is glorified in your life? We've been talking about glory on Wednesday nights, and we've, we've actually used a different word to help us really wrap our minds around, around glory and what it means and what it's about. We've, we've been using the word fame, can I ask you this? Who is famous in your life? Who does John, through the words that he's saying and what he's doing, who is John making famous in this passage? It seems clear that that was like the whole point of everything John was doing. That was his number one goal. I want to baptize. I want to preach. I want to urge people to repentance, to get ready, because I want to make the coming king famous before he gets here. That's why he's doing all that he's doing. He wants to make the king famous. And man, that's my prayer for you And for me, man, what if we lived lives that made Jesus famous? In all that we do, in every area of our life, we make Jesus famous. And I think it's unfair of me to to preach it a certain way. I I don't want you to misunderstand me, because this would be a really lame sermon if the point of it was just for you to insert Jesus into every possible conversation you have to make Jesus famous. That'd be a pretty lame sermon, and honestly, that would probably begin to look very inauthentic after a while. Like for you to go to AutoZone to buy a new headlight, but you want to make Jesus famous, and so when you get the headlight from the employee, you say, do you know who the light of the world is? Right? That's a pretty lame way to make Jesus famous. If you want to do that, that's great. Don't let me stop you, but that's not what I'm asking you to do. Okay? Instead, I'm not saying insert Jesus into every possible conversation to make him famous, but I'm asking you, reflect on each day that you live. Did I, by how I lived and I spoke and how I make decisions and all that I did today, did I make Jesus famous today in what I did and how I lived? Did I do it today? Or or what about this week, as I went through this week, as I sit down, lay down to bed on Saturday, did I make Jesus famous this week? Did I do things, did I act, did I say things in a way that made Jesus famous in my life? People saw Jesus in and through me. He was made famous through Jaron. Or maybe the most difficult and maybe the scariest question is this. On the last days of your life, at your funeral, can one of the things people say about you is in the life of them, in the life of Jaron, I can say one thing for sure. In his whole entire life, one thing he did was made Jesus famous. What a testimony would that be? Wouldn't you love for people to say that at your funeral? They made Jesus famous through everything they did and all that they said. They made Jesus famous. Hmm. Maybe I can twist it in a different direction. This really makes me uncomfortable. Can I say that in the conflict that I go through, the disagreements I have with other people, the difficult seasons, the suffering, the sickness that I go through, those are hard parts of life, but all of those are parts of life. Can I say that in those really bad parts of life, I made Jesus famous? Do I make Jesus famous in how I conflict with other people. Hmm. When I go through seasons of suffering and sickness, do I make Jesus famous? I don't know about you, but I really hope that in every conversation, in every season, in every argument, in every circumstance, that we glorify God in how we act and what we say and what we do, that we make Jesus famous famous? Or do we fail at that? 
Do we think, man, I, I realize now that I was having a conversation with someone about how bad my week was going. And I just complained about how horrible my week was, week was and, I, and I really failed to tell them where God was in the midst of all of my horrible week. I failed to make God famous in that conversation. I messed that up. Or I went through that really tough season, and it was like months and months of difficulty. And now that it's over, I realized that throughout most of it, I was just worrying and doubting and complaining. And I could have been making Jesus famous because he was right there in the midst of it with me. Or man, maybe you walk away from a disagreement with someone, with an argument, and you walk away and say, man, I really failed at making Jesus famous and how I argue and how I handle conflict. When people look at our church, when people look at our life and the words we say and how we handle ourselves, I don't know about you, but I want to be like John in this passage. I want the spotlight to be so far off of us that only Jesus is being made famous. Get me out of the way so that King Jesus can be glorified in all that we do. And what John seems to tell us in this passage is that whenever we make Jesus famous through all we do and all we say, it's not all for nothing, but the more and more and more we make Jesus famous through our lives, whether we know it or not, we're doing something very particular. You know what we're doing? What does John say? John says, I'm a voice crying out in the wilderness. And what is he crying out? Make way, make straight the way for the Lord. John was pulling from a very familiar metaphor where when you're traveling with a group of people, there were a few people who had to go ahead, especially in the wilderness, and they had to begin clearing the road of all the different hazards and all of the different sticks and logs and stones, clearing the way for the people behind them. And John seems to say that that was his job. And my argument to you is that's kind of our job as well. Because I believe that by making Jesus famous, John was clearing the way for people to approach and to come and to see Jesus. John's ministry was all about getting past all of the misunderstandings and the distractions and the legalism and the backbreaking law keeping of the Pharisees, getting all of that out of the way. How? Simply by making Jesus famous. And by doing that, he was clearing the way, making straight the way for people to come and to see and to approach Jesus who was coming. And that's what we're called to as well. We're called to make Jesus famous so that we can make straight a way for others to come and see who Jesus is. And yet... When I look out and I see how people who claim to be disciples of, the Christ, the disciples of Jesus behave and react and talk and what they post on social media and what they fight about in the comments, when I look at those things and I hear those things, I can't help to th but think that there are people who claim to know and love Jesus who think and believe that they are preparing the way so that others can come and experience the saving grace of the King Jesus. But whether they know it or not, they're actually doing the opposite. Rather than making Jesus famous, they're actually disparaging the name of Jesus because they claim to be his disciple, and yet they're acting in a way that is completely counter to the way of Jesus. And so rather than clearing the way for others to come to Jesus, I stole these from the teens, I can't help but think that instead we're placing traffic cones in the way. We're actually kind of getting in the way of other people coming to Jesus. And the way we act and the way we talk, we're not making Jesus famous, but instead in, in the ways that we act, in the way that we speak, and especially in the way we treat those we disagree with, and especially with the way we argue with other people and what we do post online, it's almost as if we do the complete opposite of John. Rather than make Jesus famous, we tarnish the reputation of Jesus, 
and we place a traffic cone getting in the way of people seeing Jesus in us and approaching Christ to come and see. And instead, they see the ways that we act in restaurants to that waiter that messes it up. You know who you are. And they see the way that we treat those people that we disagree with. And they see how we act in times of pressure and difficulty they see how we argue, and maybe it comes out how we act when nobody else is looking, and all of these things just set up traffic cones. Can I tell you, man, can I tell you, there is enough getting in the way of people coming and seeing Jesus. There are plenty, plenty, plenty of things that are keeping people from coming to a place like this, coming to church, being in a community of believers, worshiping the Lord, hearing the word. There are plenty of things that are keeping people from knowing and loving Jesus without Jesus' own disciples getting in the way. There's plenty of other things that are getting in the way without us blocking the way for people to come and see Jesus. If I claim to be a disciple of Jesus and to give him all my loyalty and all my allegiance and all my faith and all my love, should he not be made famous in my life? Man, I would hope so. Should he not be made famous in how I treat those people I disagree with the most that are completely the 100% opposite of the way Jaron was raised and what he believes and how he sees the world? Man, I hope Jesus would be made famous, especially in places like that. But man, I really worry, and I get discouraged that sometimes, rather than making Jesus famous, we block up the road. Can I tell you, here's the good news. I've beat you up. Can I tell you some good news? The good news is this. I'm going to ask Beth to come. There's some good news in the midst of this. This is a really difficult Message maybe, making Jesus famous in my life. There's pressure there. How do I do that? What does that mean? Can I just kind of take the air out of the room and let you know you don't need to have fancy words. You don't need a degree in, in theology or in scripture. You don't need to know apologetics and how to argue someone into the faith. You don't need any of that. You just throw all that to the side. You know all that you need to do? All you need to do is do some finger pointing. Did you know that? That's all you got to do. That's easy. We've been doing it since we were kids. We can do that. All you need to do is some finger pointing. All that you need to do is, in the way I act and how I live my very life, man, just point at the King Jesus and say, look and see who he is. That's all you got to do. It's just that easy. All you need to do is glorify Jesus. Make him famous. Are you doing that in your life? Or have you been setting up lots of traffic cones? Think about that individually. Do I set up, am I clearing the way or blocking it up? Do I, do I, think about this, do I myself, really think about this, do I make Jesus famous in how I live? Do I? Can I make it even more difficult for you? Families, do our family unit and how we interrelate with each other and how we handle conflict. Is Jesus made famous in our homes? And I'm not just talking about hanging up signs from Hobby Lobby. I mean, are we as a family unit, the way we act and the way we live and the habits we instill in our kids are, is Jesus made famous in our homes? Hmm. Let me ratchet it up another level. What about in your marriage? What about in the way that you argue with your spouse? There are arguments. There is conflict. But in your marriage, when people see that, is Jesus made famous in the way you react, in the way you respond, in the way you relate to your wife, to your husband? Hmm. What about you at work? I've met you at church. There's only a few of you I've been privileged enough to go to your workplace. 
I don't know the work you. Are you making Jesus famous at work? Or is that a totally different person? I don't know. And I can't help but think about this place, Spencer First. This church right here. And what we do and the ministries we do and how we react. Did you know that sometimes people know where you go to church? Did you know that? I love the ministry that Kat's doing. Sometimes I'll go to Walmart and I'll be checking out with someone and they'll call me pastor. I have no idea who they are. It's a team that come to our youth group. Did you know people know who you are sometimes? You don't know who they are? Let me ask you this. The other six days of a week that you're not in here, are you making Jesus famous? Are you making people see Spencer first as the place that makes Jesus famous? Hmm. You know what I'd love to imagine? You ever seen a map before? I don't even know what that is. I barely remember maps. But there used to be these things called maps, teens. They were paper. You'd open them up, and it has all these roads. They look like just like a crazy spider webs of road going everywhere. And if you look at Indiana, does anybody know what Indiana is called? Crossroads of America, right? Because there's all these different roads all coming together and kind of merging in Indiana, especially like in Indianapolis. You know what I'd love to see? If we could like in heaven unfold a map of Owen County, you know what I'd love to see? Is all the different people that make up Spencer first, there's like a map of all the different people who we've prepared the way to come to Jesus. I'm not even talking about our church. You know, they can come to church. We'd love to have them. I'm talking about come to Jesus. Where e by the way we've acted, because we've made Jesus famous, there's like a crossroads of America. There's all these different roads where Spencer first people have been clearing the way by how we've lived and how we've acted. And people have come to see Jesus because of that. Wouldn't you love to see that heavenly map? That'd be cool. That's my prayer for us today. And I don't know about you, but if I'm going to be called to make Jesus famous in my life and in my home and in my marriage, I'm going to need a whole lot of help. What about you? And so let's pray that God would help us to make him famous in our lives. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we're so thankful for who you are. We're thankful for who Jesus is. That he is the wonderful Messiah, the one that John was talking about. I think that even John couldn't have imagined all that Jesus had in store and all the wonderful blessings he would dispense upon us. And so God, I just pray that you would help us as your church, as your people, to make Jesus famous. That we would, all that we would do to, would go to glorify Jesus. God, I pray that there wouldn't be a misalignment between me claiming to be a disciple of Jesus and how I act. But Lord, instead I pray that people would see Jesus through our church. I pray that it would be because of Spencer First that countless number of people can walk down the road because Spencer First people, by the way they've acted and lived and ministered, prepared the way, made Jesus famous. I pray that Spencer First would have the courage to point fingers and continue to point and point and point people to Jesus Christ. Would you help us, God, as we fulfill this lofty mission? We're thankful that your spirit and your grace is enough. Lord, we ask all this in your name. And everybody said, amen. <clears throat> I'm not going to let you go quite yet. We have another piece to today's service. We're going to baptize a couple of children. And if I can be completely honest with you, I just wanted to kind of share a little bit of how we came to this moment. This has been, this is kind of the end of a very long journey for me and Annie. Whenever Annie and I had Fletcher, well, Annie had Fletcher. I was in the room, but she had Fletcher. <clears throat> Uh, we began thinking and praying about this time. Uh, we, Aunt Rosie was dedicated in our church in Columbus. We began thinking and praying about it, and 
doing a lot of research and really digging into what baptism is all about and what it means to baptize a child. So this, I want to tell you that what is happening today is not something that happened quickly or flippantly, but it is the result of literally, you can ask Annie, like a year of thinking and praying and talking um, and debating this whole thing, even before Fletcher was born. And uh, the great thing about the Church of the Nazarene is, is that we have two rituals that infants can undergo. The first is dedication, and the other is baptism. And so if you want to get your children dedicated, that is fine, and that is perfect, and that is wonderful. And if you want to get your children baptized, that is fine and perfect and wonderful. They are both welcome in our church. Um, but this here today is kind of the result of a lot of searching and praying. And if you would have asked me a year ago, I probably would have had a different answer about what we're about to do. Uh, but God's been doing a lot of speaking. And so I'm going to ask Annie to come forward with our two kiddos. And I'm also going to ask that my family would come forward. And if we could kind of split on either side and stand before the congregation in front of the altars, don't be shy. <laughs> and I'm going to try to do this without crying, but no promises. Thank you. I appreciate the permission. <clears throat> John Wesley, one of our theological forefathers, called Christian baptism the initiatory sacrament which enters us into the covenant of God. Today we affirm that infants and young children are proper subjects of this initiatory sacrament for multiple reasons. First, they are the proper subjects of baptism because of the sin of Adam in which all persons participated Paul tells us in Romans that all have, fallen, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so from birth, we carry the stain and guilt of Adam. But thank God, Christ has provided the remedy for the disease of original sin. And everybody said, Amen. it is found in his death, which was the atonement for our sin, freedom from our guilt, and the cleansing of the stain. Because of Christ's atoning blood, and the pervenient grace of God, infants and children are saved to life in the new age until they are old enough to knowingly turn from that grace. Baptism is also proper for children because of the continuity of the covenant of grace that God made with Abraham. In the Old Testament, the sign for this covenant was the circumcision done shortly, shortly after birth. With Jesus came a new covenant. And new signs of that covenant, and it's baptism, which is now the circumcision of Christ, spoken of in Colossians 2. Infants and young children can enter into the covenantal community of God just as they always could, and thus are entitled to baptism. Children are an essential part of the body of Christ, and everybody said. Amen. And children are an essential part of our church, and everybody said. Therefore, they can be initiated into the community of believers by the sacrament of baptism. <clears throat> it's very important for us to realize that baptism is not a magic rite in which salvation is imparted upon the person or child being baptized. And baptism doesn't just express the parent's hope that one day their child will repent and have faith in Christ for their salvation, although that is a part of it. Instead, when we baptize an adult or a child, that baptism wholly and completely centers around God, not the one being baptized. The focus of baptism is not a person's faith or a person's action, and it's certainly not about a young child's faith or a young child's action. Instead, infant baptism expresses God's will for the young child to be saved, not just the will of the parents and the congregation. It's a sign of God's grace and God's covenantal promises and Christ's atoning blood and the new life found in Christ. For both the adult and the child, in baptism, God is the central figure, not us. Christian baptism signifies for these young children God's loving, gracious acceptance of them 
on the basis of his provenient grace in Christ. God dearly loves them and desperately wants them. Their baptism also points forward to their personal appropriation of the benefits of the atonement when they reach the age of immoral accountability and exercise conscious saving faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Eternal and gracious God, we give you thanks in the countless ways you have revealed yourself in ages past and have blessed us with signs of your grace. We praise you that through the waters of the sea, you led your people Israel out of bondage and into freedom in the land of your promise. We praise you for sending Jesus, your son, who, was for, who for us was baptized in the waters of the Jordan and was anointed as the Christ by your Holy Spirit. Through the baptism of his death and resurrection, you set us free from the bondage of sin and death and give us cleansing and we rebirth. We praise you for your Holy Spirit, which teaches us and leads us into all truth, filling us with a variety of gifts that we may proclaim the gospel to all nations and serve you as a royal priesthood. We rejoice that you claimed us in our baptism and that by your grace we are born anew. By your Holy Spirit, renew us that we may be empowered to do your will and continue forever in the risen life of Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all glory and honor, now and forever. And everyone said, and now I want to look to my wife and to my family. I want to say this. It is our prayerful hope that these children will never step out of the grace of God that is promised in their baptism. But that as they grow in age and stature, they will also continue to grow in grace. To this end, it is our duty to teach them, as soon as they shall be able to learn, the nature and end of this holy sacrament which they participate in today. It's our duty to watch over their education that they not be led astray and to direct their feet to the sanctuary, to restrain them from evil associates and habits and as much as in us lies, to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so I want to ask my family and my wife, will you be responsible for seeing that these children we present are brought up in Christian faith and life? If so, answer, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. And now I want to turn to our congregation, our church family. I want to tell you that baptism also signifies the acceptance of these children into the community of Christian faith. And again, it is our promise and our prayer, or it is our prayerful hope that these children will never step out of the grace of God that is promised in their baptism. And so to that end, I ask you, the congregation, will you commit yourself as the body of Christ to support and encourage us as parents as we endeavor to fulfill the responsibilities to the children? And will you assist by nurturing their growth towards spiritual maturity? If so, answer, we will. we will. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we humbly pray that you will take these children into your loving care, abundantly enrich them with your heavenly grace, bring them safely through the perils of childhood, deliver them from the temptations of youth, lead them to a personal knowledge of Christ as Savior, Help them to grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all people and to persevere therein to the end. Uphold us as the parents with loving care that with wise counsel and holy example they may faithfully discharge their responsibilities to both these children and to you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And everyone said, I'll hold you. You've been so eager. And I want to read this final paragraph, and then we'll continue. This is really important. So I encourage you to, if you've listened to nothing else, if you zoned out, this is the most important part. So soon when we watch this baptism occur in front of us, it's not the child nor the parents on whom we should keep our eyes, but on the Lord God himself, who is most surely in our midst. It is not the pastor's arms in which the child is held, but in baptism, it is God taking this little one into his arms, and there God lovingly pledges himself to save them. In the child's baptism, our ears are not on the child's cry, 
but on every promise of grace that God has ever spoken. In their baptism, it's as if every general term from God's promises has been erased, and now God is writing these children's names instead. Now it's not God so loved the world, but more specifically, God so loved little Rosie, and God so loved little Fletcher that he gave his one and begotten son for them. And one day we pray that they will accept this wonderful gift. But in the meantime, in this baptism, we see before us God's promise of grace to these little souls, a provenient grace that will ever go before them, the atoning blood of Christ that covers all sin, and the gift of life everlasting that is given freely. And everybody said, amen. Amen. So let's baptize these two kids. We're going to begin with Fletcher. Can you hold, uh, can you pass off phone duties? Can you go with Auntie Ken? Fletcher Reed Rogers. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. You going to celebrate that? Rosie Jane Rogers, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Amen. You all may be seated. If you'll stand with me, can I leave you with a benediction? says this, go out to a world that hungers for righteousness. Prepare the highway for our God and make ready the paths of peace. And everyone said, Amen. amen. Go in peace today. You are dismissed. Don't forget to look at your phone number on that table on the way.